Welcome to the Woke Wife Podcast, where we talk about family, philosophy, and culture. I'm Catherine Beal, and I'm joined by my husband, Kevin. We record podcasts every weekend while our baby is napping. Find me on Twitter at Woke Wife. Today, we discuss inner critics, what they are, and how to integrate them. Enjoy! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Woke Wife podcast. I am Catherine, and I'm here with my very handsome co-host, Kevin. Hi. He's my husband, BT Dubs. <laughs> but anyway, he, he doesn't know out there. <laughs> I wouldn't call a man who's not my husband so handsome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're a little tired this morning. Uh, our baby is currently asleep, but you know, on his nap, but it took us a while to get him down. And he's been having a little bit of a six-month sleep regression. It's not been fun for the family yeah. or him or anyone. <laughs> so how are you feeling today, hubby? Oh, uh, this was a tough one. This podcast that we have? Yeah, been? prepping for it and talking about it. And a whole week of thinking about the topic has been uh, very interesting. Yeah, I think the combo... So, <laughs> Getting to the topic, we're talking about inner critics today. Yeah. And so I've been thinking about this a lot this week. And I think the combo with the sleep regression has just made it kind of a tough week <laughs> <laughs> dealing with inner critics because we'll, we can talk about this more a little later, but just talking about the inner critics sort of stirred up um, some inner critic feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just jump right in, I guess. Yeah. What... You know, for the folks out there who might not know what an inner critic is, you know, it means different things to different people. Yeah, or how we're using it anyway. Yeah, how, how do you define inner critic, darling? So an inner critic is kind of like the little angel and the little devil on your shoulder. You have these parts of yourself who have maybe different interests or want you to do things and you're in conflict with yourself because maybe these different parts want you to do different things. Mm-hmm. So is the inner critic the angel or the devil? <laughs> <laughs> well, it sort of depends, I guess. Or both. <laughs> yeah, both. Uh, usually we think about the inner critic as being the one who's condemning or demeaning you. So, like, telling you, oh, you did such an awful job with X, Y, and Z, whatever. And using a lot of contempt, right? Being like, that was stupid or something like that. Yeah, and I think people have the inner critic, but maybe aren't conscious of it like mm-hmm. as... Uh, a, a voice. distinct yeah. voice, yeah, right. They just kind of hear it as, or feel it as shame. Because I know we've we've sort of developed our rapport with our inner critics, and so it might be a little different for others out there. Mm-hmm. But it's really useful to think about these parts as separate and distinct and having their own voices. So, what is the difference between? And we're going to talk about this later, so I just want to make sure we set it up initially. Yeah. Define our terms. Yeah, define our terms. So when we talk about the inner critic being shame producing, let's clarify that a little. So there's a healthy shame and then there's toxic shame. What, what's the difference between those? I think the difference between healthy and toxic shame is the difference between the statements, I am bad versus I am lacking or I could be improved. Mm, okay. So the content of the shame like I did such a terrible job on whatever. My self-worth isn't at, really at stake so much. Mm-hmm. And so it's a productive kind of feedback that you're getting. Right. How can I do this better? This particular behavior wasn't good. Mm-hmm. How can I improve? Versus what's the other side of that? Versus the type of shame that is like evaluate, like I am totally bad. I am uh, worthless or mm. a bad person or it's caught up in your self-esteem your self-worth yeah. and in your identity i think identity yeah. is a big part of this who i am as a person is evil even <laughs> inside right. like that's kind of the message that i i know i used to receive from my inner critic or you know so something maybe girls out there can relate to this one or guys too probably but saying like that you're fat like I'm, oh you're just such a badass or something like right. that like which oh i would never say that to a friend of mine or anything like that but there's a voice that feels free to say that in some right way. or i could never get her she would never want to be with somebody like me kind of thing oh yeah yeah i think that's the sort of toxic 
mm-hmm. unproductive. It's not going to lead to anything good to think in those kind of terms. Right. That actually fits in a little bit with something I want us to talk about, which uh, you had a really interesting perspective on the inner critic and feedback mechanisms. Mm. You think you were saying, so this relates to biology, so bear with us if this is a little out of your scope. And it's not directly related to shame or, or self-knowledge, but it's, it's an interesting concept. So just the, talking about the toxic shame and like what makes something toxic and what makes something healthy reminded me of these feedback mechanisms. Right. So I think it might be a good time to mention them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, feedback mechanism in biology can be either positive or negative. It doesn't necessarily like mean negative in that it's bad. So a negative feedback mechanism is something which corrects where a positive feedback mechanism produces more of the same. So <clears throat> so the negative is meaning like you're taking away because you're correcting something. Yeah, so you yeah. have to, to alter it. Some, subtra- sort of. some, some kind of subtraction there. And the positive is an addition, like continuing a behavior. So right. Making, making it more. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, some examples, the negative feedback mechanism is sweating. So if we get really hot, we sweat and that cools us down. So you're going in the direction of being too hot and there's a negative feedback mechanism that called sweating. Away, yeah, which, that takes away the heat. Yeah. <laughs> and a positive feedback mechanism, an example of that, is when you're giving birth or having contractions and getting ready to give birth. Your baby is pushing down on the cervix and the what happens is that your cervix gets ready for giving birth and it causes the baby to be pushed down even more. So it's like a cyclical uh, positive feedback mechanism that <laughs> makes more of itself. Right. Right. I'm not explaining it. And you should have mentioned that we were going to talk about birth. I need a trigger warning. <laughs> <laughs> Flashbacks. JK. <laughs> and so how that might relate to shame is if you have shame, which is, productive and it's getting you to not uh, do something embarrassing so or you know with a healthy shame around food if you see yourself eating chocolate for for example you know, just, <laughs> not that we know anything not that, that. I like that that's like a issue for me or anything <laughs> <laughs> but you know if you're eating a few chocolates you might start to have a little bit of healthy shame oh, maybe I should stop and not eat the entire bag. Right. <laughs> Versus a toxic shame that's saying, like, oh, I'm so terrible. I just ate all these chocolates. Like, I am the worst person in the world. And when you get down on yourself in that way, I think it's there's a self-fulfilling prophecy there. And it's going to encourage you to eat more chocolates <laughs> right. rather than stop at the healthy amount. <laughs> right. Not that there's really a healthy amount of chocolate, but... Uh, a moderation, a moderate. Names and fates often agree. So if you call yourself a fatty who just loves chocolate and can't <laughs> help himself or something like that, mm-hmm. then you're going to produce more of that behavior. So I just I thought that was that was a very interesting insight my hubby made earlier this week. So definitely wanted to feature that in here. But just to expand a little more about what we're talking about <laughs> in terms of parts. You know, we all have different parts of the self. I just wanted to have an example here for to exemplify it. And this is kind of a silly example, but I think as introverts over here, we can relate to this one. Maybe part of us wants to go to a party and another part wants to stay home. So negotiating, that's a conflict there. So negotiating between the two, you know, who wins in this scenario and how do they win? I mean, the part that wants to go to the party, does it shame the other, the shy part or the tired part who wants to stay home? Or do they take those parts to talk about their values being like, okay, what's, what's important to us? You know, is like our sleep tonight really important? Because, you know, as new parents, (laughs) I can see us deciding that it's better for our health and for ourselves to stay home. (laughs) But then there's another part of us that wants to foster relationships and maybe push to push our push out of our comfort zone to go to the party so that's just 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 kind of exemplify what we mean a little Mm -hmm. so this is very different from multiple personality disorder multiple personality disorder is what is that exactly (laughs) so another name for it is dissociative 
personality disorder. And it's basically you have multiple personalities that are totally unaware of each other. And it's really kind of a crazy thing. And uh, people actually, when they, when the, these parts of themselves, which are sort of literal parts that like host, it's like not mm-hmm. like the host, you know, they take over. Yeah. And like a demon possession or something. And don't people like black out too? They don't even remember what oh, happened. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. And if you ever seen that television show, the United States of Terra, I don't know how accurate it is to this multiple personality to MPD, mm-hmm. but it's pretty freaky. And <laughs> <laughs> this is not what we're talking about with parts work. Parts work is a therapeutic tool to integrate the self, to learn more about what you're thinking, to give give your process of understanding your thoughts more structure. You're kind of giving this part of voice, that part of voice, and you're helping negotiate rather than just having it all jumbled. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. But yeah. so it's just a framework and a tool. And I just want to make that very clear that it's different. Yeah. Articulating things which are kind of on the edge of your consciousness and just giving things making things explicit, like, I think this, and it's not just something that's sort of fuzzy and dark in the background. Exactly. Fuzzy and dark, I like that. (laughs) (laughs) And, I mean, I know we've actually spoken to each other's inner critics, and I think someone from the outside, like, it could have very easily looked like we were crazy. (laughs) (laughs) But we were just using it as a tool, and I think it was a very helpful tool for us. So I just want to make that clear. And speaking of therapy, there's some... There's some schools of thought for integration of these voices, of these parts, of these dark, fuzzy parts of the brain. And uh, there's something, there's, let's just go over a few. There's internal family systems, IFS. There's the Jungian active imagination. There's gestalt chair exercises. And also the Miko system theory, which I believe is Stefan Molyneux's original. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So do you want to tell us a little bit about IFS? Sure. So it's a framework. It comes out of family systems therapy, which is a broader sort of category. And it's uh, how all the different parts of yourself relate to each other. And any part that is basically anything other than totally curious and open, you just treat it by default as a part and part of a larger system of Mm. interrelated relationships between the parts of yourself okay and so the part that is curious and open that's that's the self the capital s self capital s self okay interesting interesting and tell me a little bit more about Jungian active imagination because i know you had a Jungian therapist so you did some of these things firsthand right yeah well uh, sort of tell me more so i basically did it mostly in the form of art journaling and scripted dialogues between me and different parts of myself and mm. those parts with each other and that kind of thing. But it, if you go see a union therapist, you might see a sand a uh, sandbox, sandbox <laughs> and like toy figures and like clay to play with. And Is it unlocking like the creative side of your brain to help you? Yeah, it's kind of like a dream. So you're just bringing things up from down underneath that may not have ever been given any kind of voice and uh you just not giving it too much thought you're not analyzing things you're just Mm -hmm. kind of playing like a child almost oh okay and then you can analyze it afterwards if you want you know this this sort of idea interesting interesting sounds like fun i feel feel relaxed just thinking about playing with the sandbox (laughs) (laughs) um now i did some of the gestalt chair exercises with my therapist who was a coherence therapist and so some of the things we would do we would do two chair which was I would sit on one side and talk to a certain part and then I would go and sit in the other chair and actually physically get up and move over to the other side to be to sort of personify the other part and I remember I actually did one of these things by myself not in therapy right after you would ask me out on our first date. I was really nervous, and I, I listened to this a few months ago. It was so funny because I did it on, I recorded this where I talked with anxiety part of myself. Yeah. who was nervous to talk to Kevin Beal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so that's some of the stuff with just all. They could also do empty chair exercises where you visualize maybe even 
a person over there, but of course the person, so if it's like a parent or something from your childhood who was abusive, you imagine the parent there and what you would say to them, but they're not literally there. It's just kind of the parent part that's in your head, right. if that makes sense. And then, of course, Mikosystems. And I did, I did some Mikosystem work myself. This is actually my favorite way to do parts work. And it was inspired by Stefan Molyneux's description. So I would, with Mikosystems for myself, I'm curious how you've tried Mikosystems, but I will bring up a Word document or a Google Doc and do it kind of like I'm writing a play. And I'll ask, you know, if anybody is want to speak up in there. And I get really in the zone with it. And I'm a writer, so maybe that's more, maybe some of the other people would prefer talking at these things out. But I love, I love doing that, and the, the writing kind of slows me down enough to be able to articulate these voices. And I've had, you know, part like a cheerleader part who will come up, and be like rah rah, do this, and then a cynical part who wants to talk. <laughs> it can be kind of dramatic sometimes, going <laughs> back and forth with all these parts. But it's, it's really interesting. I always get something out of the exercise whenever I do it that way, and that's actually the tool I used this week when I had my inner critic speaking up a little bit. I went to the sort of playwriting, ecosystem style, not inviting all the voices, just inviting the inner critic, and it was really helpful. And so now I want to introduce just a couple of concepts and get your ideas on them. Sure. So the first one is integration. So I have an idea of what I think integration might be, and I want to hear your thoughts. Okay. So I think integration is having a healthy reality-based view of yourself. So what I mean by that is being aware first that you have these shames or anxieties or things that are unpleasant that you might be inclined to deny or disown or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you, instead of doing that, instead of saying, I'm not anxious, you know, I'm feeling anxious, but I'm going to survive. Right. Accepting Accepting the emotion, right? first and foremost. And then second is having it be reality-based. So I might have a part that says, I will never, ever get Catherine to marry me. <laughs> She's too good. I'm too, I'm a worm or something like that. I don't think that's very reality-based. I mean, obviously that example is not reality-based because we are married. And you're a sexy, sexy man, <laughs> not a worm. <laughs> Yeah, if so reality based, like if you accept something which is totally untrue, then that's not good either. So it's right. So for instance, my my inner critic, sometimes I need to bring her closer to reality because she'll get really upset with me for something like not finishing a to do list. Mm -hmm. And I have to kind of remind her about what our resources were for that day and how much energy we had, how much time we had, you know, things like that. She doesn't sometimes take these things into account, how long things take. Right. <laughs> so that's kind of bringing the inner critic closer to reality. But tell me more. Yeah, so I think uh, integration, the work to integrate is just to make, to articulate what's actually happening in your mind. And I think these exercises we talked about are really good for that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, yeah, and having a more reality-based view of things, I think it goes along with that. Because if I actually make it totally explicit that, oh, I'm just, I'm a worm, saying it out loud, I hear myself and I'm probably going to say, oh, well, wow, that's maybe overstating things a little. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> maybe a little dramatic. Right. So if you're just feeling it on this emotional level, like a, a shame attack, for instance, and it just feels overwhelming. But when you actually give voice to that shame and help it, you know, whenever you name an emotion, it automatically becomes more manageable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's been scientifically proven or research-based yeah. proven kind of thing. Yeah. So I think integration is becoming more aware and in tune with reality. Reality. I like that. I like that a lot. Because there is a lot and a lot about these parts that maybe aren't in touch with reality. Like for instance, they there might be a part that's sort of stuck in childhood that still thinks that a parent has control over you or mm -hmm. can't, you know, you can't escape that parent in your head. <laughs> right. But the reality is, you know, you're an adult, you can make your own choices, things like that. Right. 
So yeah, I think that's a really great point to make about um, about integration. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but my my inner critic prefers the term integration to something like dealing with these parts, yeah. <laughs> these tedious parts of ours. Yeah, yeah, I've got to make them go away. You know, yeah. Something like that. You know, we don't want to banish these parts. We want to integrate them, make them a part of the self, make them heard, visible, They're- so that we feel. Coherent. They're our thoughts. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) We would just be denying ourselves, like saying, having an evaluate, like I'm bad. It's just, it's its own kind of shame, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And the second concept that I wanted to introduce is ego strength. Mm. And I'm I'm kind of pulling this one out of my butt a little bit. I've never actually looked up the term, but basically I think ego strength is related to the ideas of healthy and unhealthy shame. Mm -hmm. Toxic shame versus healthy shame. Okay. So you have things that make that's the difference between I am bad versus I am lacking and I can, you know, improve. Right. So having ego strength is having stability in I my self worth isn't just gonna get blown over by a, a gentle breeze because some amount of shame came up that was toxic. Right. All of a sudden I'm I'm not a good person anymore. Mm-hmm. I remember once I was talking to my sister on the phone and she was telling me about something that was going on and something that her husband was doing. And I commented, I was like, oh, he's just trying to make you do that because he feels guilty. And I don't want to go into all the details, but I remember he, she actually told him that I said (laughs) that on the phone. Like he was right there. And I was like, what are you doing? You shouldn't have told him that. Because I thought he was going to feel a little bad that I, that I said that, but instead of being like, Oh, mad at me or like, he just laughed it off. He was like, Oh, she got me. I do feel guilty, (laughs) blah, 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 you know? And I remember you commenting that that showed a lot of ego strength. Yeah. Self-assuredness, I think is another way of putting it. Yeah. He didn't get defensive and attack me or deny it in any way. He just accepted it, laughed it off being like, Oh yeah, I do feel guilty. Yeah, I think it's very the most mature way you could probably handle it. Yeah, definitely. And so being gaining ego strength, I think is turning toxic shame into productive shame. So instead of I'm never going to be worthy of Catherine's love, instead turning that into something like maybe she wouldn't yet be interested in me or there's something about myself that I should work on Mm -hmm. and then actually working on those things. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So having the ego strength, I am good enough or I'm, you know, potentially good enough or whatever. It's, I'm not crushed by it. Right. It reminds me of some things I've heard about applying for jobs. So I've heard, and I've heard this is a difference between men and women. Men, when they see a job posting, like say online, and they look at the qualifications, if they don't have any of the qualifications, a lot of times they'll just be like, oh, okay, I don't have those qualifications, but I know I can get to be that qualified. I know I, you know, I don't have the experience, but I'll be able to figure it out. I'll be able to learn it. And they apply for the job anyway. Whereas women tend to, I think this might maybe because women don't have as much ego strength as men on, on the whole, possibly, but they'll see the job qualifications. And if they don't meet every one, they won't even apply for the job. Right. And that this is a, you know, part of the wage gap or something like that has to do with ego strength. (laughs) Right. I wonder how much risk aversion, because women naturally with higher levels of estrogen Mm -hmm. are more risk averse. I wonder if taking on more risk is a kind of Mm self-assuredness or ego strength. Confidence. Yeah. I wonder how those are related. Not sure. Our baby has actually woken up. So we're going to have to wrap this up. Obviously, inner critic, you know, this is a huge topic. We could go on for a lot longer write about this. About, we could yeah. definitely write a book about it. Maybe we'll do a part two at some point. Um, and I just want to say that these are our opinions. We're not professionals. Yeah. <laughs> we have, you know, done a lot of work in therapy. We've worked with our inner critics a lot, but if you're having trouble with your inner critic, please seek therapy. Um, I've written a whole book about how to find a great therapist. Yeah. So. <laughs> and if you're like us, just bringing up the topic, bringing more awareness to things that I was denying or disowning, just didn't want to think about, those came up. Mm-hmm. So if you have that come up for you, then you know, 
it might come up. <laughs> <laughs> well put, though. Yeah. No, I mean, it's true. Like, just talking about this stuff, just maybe even listening to this podcast could stir some things up for you, you know? I mean, I know just doing the preparation stirred some stuff up for us, and that's good. It's, it shows us an opportunity to to improve more, to yeah. explore ourselves more, to get more connected with that inner self mm-hmm. and and the inner critic is a part of that self. So um, did you have any closing thoughts, darling? Yeah, maybe we'll do a part two or something later and you know, I'm really curious what people think. Yeah, um, I could yeah. I could talk more about my our experiences um, with this, so we have lots of thoughts. But anyway, our baby is She needs us, us, so we will talk to you all later. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, be sure to follow me on Twitter at WokeWife. See you next week.